Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Grace United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are here, especially if this is your first time to worship with us. Thank you for being part of this family of faith this morning. We promise you will experience God's love and God's grace and God's spirit right here in this place. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online, thank you for joining us. We, uh, we are, are so grateful that we have this technology, that we can worship even when we're not all in one place. So thank you for joining us. We do consider you part of this service as if you were right here in the room. And so thank you for joining us today. It is good to be back. You may, I don't know if you noticed, I wasn't here last week. Last week, I was leading worship in Tochi, Mexico for, a, uh, for our team, but also for the, uh, the, the people that were there at the Methodist Church in Tochi. And so if I stop every couple sentences to wait for the translator to say something, just bear with me. That's kind of a strange way to lead worship, but you learn how to do it. And so it was good to be in Tochi, and we all made it back safe. You'll hear more about that Tochi trip next week when we uh, have some of our group members share their experience with you in worship. But I do want to lift up just a couple of other things. First, there are attendance pads in the pews. We'd love it if you'd fill those out and pass them down the row and then pass them back to see who's there with you. We uh, also um, want to lift up that uh, today is the Good Faith Network's solutions uh, briefing right here at Grace. And if you don't know what that is, Good Faith Networks is a, a network of, of churches and, and other religious groups that uh, have a specific passion for justice here in Johnson County. And what can we do to make a difference for justice? And so we're going to have people from churches all over Johnson County and, and other people who are concerned meeting here at Grace at 3 o'clock to hear more about what Good Faith Networks is doing, but also to be part of that conversation to say, what else can we do? Because Good Faith Networks, they've, they've uh, decided to uh, focus in on three specific goals. The first is to end homelessness right here in Johnson County, which we think is doable. It's not a large problem. It shouldn't be a problem at all. So how can we end homeless, homelessness? How can we create places for people to, to stay when they're in, in those situations. Second is to create affordable housing. You may notice uh, that housing is a little expensive here. How do we create affordable housing for, uh, for people? And the third is to address the mental health crisis. Those are the three goals. And the, the solutions briefing is a chance to, to not only share a little bit about what, uh, what our voice or what our thoughts are, but also to hear what's going on and, and what difference it's making. And it is amazing the difference they have made in just a few years. So three o'clock right here at Grace United Methodist Church, anyone is invited to come and be a part of that. Uh, also, uh, if you have missed out on potlucks, if you're a good United Methodist, you know that's our third sacrament is the potluck. And uh, so the uh, Common Grace has started uh, having potlucks once a month, and we're all invited too. And so next week is the first potluck, 1130, right at Grace Gathering. If you'd like to, to come and just fellowship with people, everyone is invited to the potluck. And uh, there's some information in the bulletin on what to bring based on the, the, the first letter of your last name. And so just uh, wanted to lift that up to you. And, uh, and then finally, we, uh, we are in a sermon series right now where we are talking about Wesley today. Now what that means, and, and Wesley are which, by the way, I think was named after John Wesley. Wesley started that... Oh. <laughs> Charles. Oh, he's named after Charles. Ah, one of, one of the Wesley brothers. Anyway, he, uh, he started last week on this series, and what we're doing is taking six of John Wesley's most famous sermons. I know you've all read all of Wesley's sermons, but, but six of his best, and then saying, how would we preach that today? in our way and in, in, a, in a way that maybe makes sense to, uh, to some of us. And so uh, I gave Wesley the almost Christian last week because that's the one where John scolds everybody. I didn't want to do that. So we're going to, uh, to look at his sermon, The New Birth Today. And to do that, Wesley introduced the West John Wesley bobblehead, which is going to stay on the pulpit throughout this series just as a reminder that, uh, that John Wesley is here. We actually, between the two of us, have three John Wesley bobbleheads. <laughs> and so uh, we just figured one of them could stay in the sanctuary during this time and just remind us, these are John Wesley's sermons and the things that he was uh, trying to share with the early Methodists, but what do they have to say to us today? 
And during this time, we're going to be singing Charles Wesley hymns throughout. And so every week you'll have at least one, if not more than one, Charles Wesley hymn. And uh, we, are, we are really going to get our Wesley on this, uh, the next few weeks. So I, uh, I'm grateful that you are here. And uh, let's uh, stand together as we join in our call to worship. From water and the spirit, life is born. Through water and the spirit, new life begins. By water and the spirit, eternal life is sustained. Let us celebrate being born anew in Christ and worship God. I would invite us to join in our first hymn this morning, number 715, Rejoice the Lord is King. Before you sit down, we'd invite you to uh, turn and to greet your neighbors and to pass the peace of Christ. Maybe introduce yourself to somebody you haven't met yet this morning. Good morning. Good morning. It was good. It was good As we continue our time of worship this morning in prayer, I invite you to be seated and to join me in an attitude of prayer. Good and gracious God, we gather to give thanks and praise for the many and wondrous gifts that you have bestowed upon us. From the sun that shines, the rain that falls, the wind that blows, the seeds that grow from the ground. We give thanks for all those gifts that continue to nurture our lives and the lives of those around us. We give thanks for the opportunity to gather here. 
to worship, to give thanks, and to offer ourselves to you. We give thanks for the opportunity to to worship in places and to reach places that, that we never could have imagined. And we gather here to remember, to honor, and to hear the words of those who have come before us. We pray as we worship this morning that you would be with us, that you would continue to provide, and that you might reawaken the fire within us to reignite the love within us for you and for our neighbors. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Expand thy wings, celestial dove, brood o'er our nature's night. On our disordered spirits move, and let there now be light. God, through the Spirit we shall We come now to that time of our worship in which we offer ourselves. One of the ways we can do that is through our tithes and our offerings. You'll find ways to give on our screen. You'll also uh, notice the ushers coming to wait upon us. But I'd also invite us to reflect on the ways in which we can be in live service to our neighbors as well. What is our hope? Christ, our hope in life 
Good and gracious God, we ask that you would take and use these gifts, that you would bless them, the hands that have given, the hands that shall receive, that they might be used to do your work in the world. Amen. We're reading today from John 3, 1 through 8. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came by Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The word of God for the people of God.
Will you pray with me this morning? Gracious God, as we come and we explore these sermons of John Wesley, as we listen for those words that speak to us today, I pray that the words of my mouth, but the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you. For Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this past Monday, I was in Puebla, Mexico, with our, our mission team, and we had just finished all of our work in Tochi and had traveled back to Puebla. We had one more day in Puebla before we'd get on the bus the next morning early to get to the airport and, and head back home. And it just happened to be the same day as the solar eclipse. And Puebla was a pretty good place to see the solar eclipse. It wasn't a full eclipse or a total eclipse, but it was, it was pretty close. And uh, it was a beautiful day weather-wise, not a cloud in the sky. And so uh, we had gathered on the, the Zocalo, which is kind of this, this square in the art district. It has a huge Catholic church on one side, which is just very impressive to go in. And then the other three sides have different restaurants or shops or, or different things. But it's a, a great courtyard. There's some artwork in it. And it was packed. I mean, there were, there were lots of people out there to see the solar eclipse. And there was somebody that had a, a telescope that you could look through, and there's a long line to, to get into that. And we were all out there with our glasses looking up at different times to see it. And, and just in the middle of that, and all that commotion, all those people, all of a sudden, I heard this very loud voice. And, and it wasn't with a microphone, but boy, this guy could project. And I looked over, and he was standing on some steps that led up to a fountain that's kind of in the middle of the Zocalo. And he was just orating to whoever would listen to him. And I remember I looked at my group, and I said, I don't know if he's making a political speech or a religious speech because I didn't speak the language. And so I, I was listening, but boy, he was, see, it's, it's around election time there. Or there's a lot of election things. And so we saw some political uh, speeches or, or events as well. But, but I kept listening. I thought, maybe I'll hear a word I recognize that'll remind me what it is. I was listening for like a, a Jesus Christos or, or something that would stand out and I'd say, oh, now I know what he's talking about. But I, I couldn't hear any of that. And I just kept kind of wondering as we kept looking up, and all of a sudden, I could understand every word he was saying. Now, it wasn't because he was speaking in tongues and I was interpreting. He switched to English. <laughs> no miracles here. But I could understand it. And it was like he, he had done his whole speech and now he was going to do it again in English. And, uh, and I, I couldn't hear everything clearly, but I realized right away, nope, this is a religious speech. And uh, because he started talking to the group about how the eclipse was a sign from God and that it was, it was uh, prophesied by the prophet Jonah and, and that we needed to repent and follow Jesus. And this was a sign of God's judgment, a condemnation on the wickedness of the people. And we needed to repent and turn to Jesus and be born again. And uh, he was begging people. At one time I heard him say, I'm begging you, please turn to God. Repent before it's too late. 
Now, I, I'm not sure if he had any response. He didn't from any in our group, at least. And, and I kind of looked. I didn't see anybody go up and talk to him. But I did notice later, after he was done, I, I saw him just sitting on the bench, just kind of very proud of himself that he had done what God had called him to do and that he was kind of a modern-day Jonah coming to the, the Nineveh of Mexico, I guess, and, and uh, sharing uh, what he believed was the Word of God. He had done his job. But uh, the experience made me think of a couple of things. One is how I would never do that because I'd feel so uncomfortable. But the second is it made me think of John Wesley because John Wesley is known for going out into the fields to preach. And not because he wanted to. He wanted to preach in the church. In fact, he believed that the, the sanctuary was the only pop, uh, proper place to have worship. Except the sanctuaries wouldn't have him. The churches wouldn't have him. He had uh, had a reputation after a while as an enthusiast. That he was a little too enthusiastic to be uh, leading worship in church. And so the church doors became closed to him. Now, just a sidebar. I have read an awful lot of John Wesley's sermons, not as many as Wesley, but, but I've, I've read a lot. I don't see anything in them that makes me think enthusiast. <laughs> they're, they're not the most energetic readings in the world, but he must have preached them with flair because he, uh, he got that reputation and, and uh, was unable to preach in the churches. But he had many subjects, and uh, one of his most common subjects was the new birth or a spiritual birth. In fact, he preached on this subject over 60 times in his life. I was trying to think, is there any subject that I've preached about more than 60 times? And maybe grace, but besides that, I, I don't know if there's any subject. For, but, but for John, this was an important subject. And, and, and when I think of uh, Wesley's view of the new birth, it might be... It might be a little different than the young man that I met in, in Puebla this past week. It's not exactly the same, but, but, and maybe I should just start by saying, you know, there's a lot of baggage with that term born again. I mean, we can just admit that. If, if somebody comes up to you and says, are you a born again Christian? We kind of know exactly what that means, that it's a loaded question. It's not just, oh, are you a follower of Jesus or, or you, have you been saved? It, it's, it sometimes means this is the litmus test. If you can say yes, well, we know you're in. And if you say no, well, you're out. And, and it becomes uh, um, you know, something where, where there's this secret society that knows what that means and get a secret handshake, I think. And they, it's really code for a certain brand of Christianity. But uh, the... It, it, it focuses, that, that brand focuses very much on conversion, getting everybody converted. And, and I don't have a problem with spiritual experiences. In fact, I've seen plenty of them. I, I know that they are, are real. Uh, but I think Wesley would say, would, would tell us that, that that's important, but there's more to it. See, my problem is that when, when that spiritual experience, that born-again experience becomes the ultimate destination for Christians, that, that's when I, I think it misses the mark a little bit. That uh, this idea that you're born again and then you're done and then you, you just go do whatever you want. I think Wesley would say there's so much more to the journey and the process. And so, as we look at Wesley's sermon today on the new birth, he begins by asking three questions. Questions are this, why must we be born again? Two, how must we be born again? And three, wherefore must we be born again? Which is kind of Wesleyan language or, or New King James-ish language, but it really means what is the purpose? I mean, what difference does it make for somebody to have the new birth? And I think to understand why this was important to Wesley, we, we kind of need to dig into his story and what happened to him. So John Wesley was a priest in the Church of England, just like his father Samuel, and, and uh, eventually went to Oxford where he was a brilliant student. He was extremely committed to his faith. And while he was at Oxford, he started this group called the Holy Club, 
Now, just so you know, that's not the name that Wesley gave it. I mean, Wesley's plenty arrogant, but he didn't come up with the name the Holy Club for himself and his group. That was given to them by the other students. Because this group that Wesley had, they would meet on a regular basis, actually daily, to study the scriptures, to encourage one another. But also, they became very strict with each other on on what behaviors were appropriate. They were trying to seek out holiness. And their biggest problem is they like to tell everybody else how they should seek out holiness and what they should be doing and how they're doing it wrong, which doesn't make you very popular at the college. And, and so the other students became critical of this group. They, they made fun of them. They called them the Holy Club or the Bible Mods. But here's a poem they wrote about them. They said, by rule they eat, by rule they drink, by rule they do all things but think. Accuse the priests of loose behavior to get more in the layman's favor. Methods alone guide them all when themselves Methodists they call. So if you get it, we are called Methodists today because people who were making fun of John Wesley called him a Methodist. That's where our name comes from. It was supposed to be derogatory, and Wesley says, ah, oh, I actually kind of like that. And so that's why we have Methodists today. But but John was incredibly disciplined, and uh, especially in trying to follow the scriptures and to live out what he thought was right. But he also was missing something. And he would tell you himself, and it was assurance. Finding this assurance that how do I know that I'm forgiven? How do I know that... I'm loved by God. How do I know that any of this is real? Where do I find that assurance? And so he decided to go on a missionary journey to Georgia because that was the new world at the time. And he wrote in his journal, my chief motive is the hope of saving my own soul. I hope to learn the true sense of the gospel of Christ by preaching it to the heathens. That's what he called the people that were already in Georgia. And so he, he gets on a boat and he, he goes to Georgia to, with James Oglethorpe and the colony there, and it was an utter disaster. It, it wasn't anything like he expected when he got there. And uh, after a couple of years, he returned depressed for many reasons. But one important experience happened on his journey to Georgia. When he was on the boat going to the colonies, there was this incredible storm that came up. And it was so dangerous, the people on the boat really believed that they were going to perish, that they might not survive this. They were all scared to death, including John, except for this one small group of Christians, Moravians, a German sect. And during this storm, when everybody else thinks that that they're going to perish, here they are singing hymns and praying and uh, and didn't seem to have any anxiety at all. They, They weren't showing any fear, which impressed John. And so later, after the storm was over, he asked them why they weren't afraid, why it is that they didn't have the same fears and anxiety as everybody else. And they said to him, well, do you know Jesus Christ? And he said, I know he's the savior of the world. And they responded, true. But do you know that he has saved you? And John said, I do. But he writes in his journal, I wrote, I fear they were vain words. I didn't believe them myself. And so Wesley returns back to to England, and he's still seeking that assurance. He spends a lot of time with the Moravians. He figures they have something that he doesn't, that that maybe they can teach him or show him. He, He seemed to have all this knowledge about what it meant to follow Jesus or to be faithful, but he still wasn't sure in his heart what any of that meant. And a few years later... He was attending a prayer meeting on Aldersgate Street. And someone was reading from Luther's preface to the book of Romans, which, by the way, is not the most exciting reading in the world. But something happened to John during that reading. 
something he didn't expect or anticipate. And he wrote in his journal this, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now, I'm not sure anybody that was there that day would have noticed anything different about John, that they wouldn't have seen something miraculous or that he would have have even shared it with people, but something happened to him that changed his life. It was like all this knowledge that he had up in his head about his faith somehow sunk down into his heart, and he found this assurance that, that God loved even him. His heart was strangely warmed that day. And for Wesley, this is the experience that answers the first two questions of his sermon. Why must I be born again? For him, it's because it gives us the assurance, not only that God is real, but that we are loved by God, that we are are forgiven by God. It's not something that that we can just logically assume, but something that, that happens within us, that somehow we discover God's love is real in us. I think it's very similar to what Jesus told Nicodemus in our scripture today when they had that discussion. And Jesus says to him, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Or I think a better translation, born from above. I mean, Nicodemus, he's confused by that. And he says, well, how can I crawl back into my mother's womb and uh, be born again? And he says, no, no, no. It's not again, it's about what God does in our lives. It's about being born from above, that that God is revealed to us in some way that maybe we can't even answer. But I think it also answers the second question, how are we born again? I mean, Jesus tells Nicodemus that the wind blows wherever it wants, that, that we can't control the wind, and that's exactly how the Spirit works. We can't control God's Spirit either. It, it, it's just that at some point in our lives when we're ready and it blows, it sinks in. It, it tells us that we're loved. We find that same assurance and that, uh, that, that God's spirit is, is something that changes us from the inside out. But I think the third question is the most important and maybe what makes us a little different. And that is, what is the purpose of any of this? And I think the answer is, well, that's up to us. You know, it's, it's interesting that Wesley's life was changed significantly at Aldersgate that night. And, and in that moment, he, he really began a journey that led him to become a giant of our faith that, that transformed the world in many ways. And, and as United Methodists, we look back and stand in that tradition that goes to that moment on Aldersgate. And yet John never mentions it in any of his sermons, even the one on new birth. He doesn't talk about this in that sermon. He doesn't talk about it in any sermons. The only place he talks about it is in his journal. Now, he probably said some things to people or or shared the story, but not in any kind of written form except in his journal. Why is that? I think because for John, it was significant, but it was only the beginning It's not the destination. Our goal in life is not to be born. I mean, none of us came out of the womb and yelled, Woohoo! I finally made it. I'm done. We know that that's the beginning of the story, not the end. You see, the nature of new birth is a changed life, which is exactly what Wesley says in his sermon, The New Birth. How do we know what's so for? That, that is the new birth about, it's about how we are changed. What difference does it make? And for Wesley, it changed everything. It changed the trajectory of his life. It changed how he interacted with people. It's about change. You know, this week, I got to witness new birth in action when I was with the group in Tochi. You know, between the, our team from Grace and the team from the, the Methodist Church in Arizona, we had 32 people on the trip together. And we began the whole event, or when we got there, by listening to each other's stories. We invited people to share why it is they had come, how many times they had come, and and what they were looking for. 
And at the end, we asked a different question. How have you been changed by this experience? What difference does it make? And I sat and I listened to people over and over tell how that trip had given them new life. Maybe not on that specific one this year, but in, in the past when they had gone and, and how they had, had experienced God and how it had changed them, that many of them said, I just came because I thought I wanted to help people and I left changed as a human being. And, and maybe not right away, but, but uh, I think the most significant change that I saw was in my cousin Mark, who, who led the trip, who has gone many times now, and he's been very open about his life and the difference that it made. But, but he went to Tochi, not just because he thought maybe he could see a different part of the world, but he did not go thinking that his life was going to change at all. In fact, he went to Tochi the first time as an atheist. And he came back that year, and he was still an atheist. But he went back the next year as an atheist. And he says, I... Don't know why, but something happened. Something changed within me. And I returned home to the church believing that God loves even me, that God is real, that I too am forgiven. I, I would say his heart was strangely warmed on the trip. But here's the thing is, that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning because now... What we see is not just that, that he enjoys going to Tochi or something happened there, but a changed life. Mark was the leader of our trip this year. He, he put everything together and, and led us through all the decisions. Mark and Lisa together teach disciple Bible study. I have to tell you, I have known Mark since we were infants. We were born just months apart. And to see the change that has happened in him is truly miraculous. It is nothing that I would have ever expected. You know, in his sermon, Wesley says, the nature of new birth is changed. A changed heart that leads to a changed life. But there's, there's something else important that he says and that we need to know. He doesn't see it as a one-time event. It's not that, are you born again, and, then, and then, uh, then you're in, but it's something that God does over and over and over again in our lives. That new birth is when God's Spirit blows, and somehow it comes and, and, and lives within us and changes who we are. And it happens again and again. It's a continuous blowing of the Spirit. And so the challenge for us as United Methodists who stand in this tradition, is, to, is are we open to God's spirit blowing again? Are we open to see what God will do in our lives? Are we, are we feeling that assurance that God loves even us? And the most important, are we changed because of that relationship with Christ? my room shining hours were brief winter is over summer is near are we stronger than we believe I walk through halls of a reputation among the infamous too as a camera to a common thread beyond all vanity into a gaze to shoot you through is the kindness we count upon hidden in everyone I spent there in a sunlit grove although deep down I wished it would rain thank you washing away the sadness and tears that will never fall so heavily again.
is a kindness we count upon Hidden in everyone I stood there in the salt spray air Felt the wind sweeping over my face Ran up through the rocks to the old wooden cross It's a place where I can find some peace You know, John Wesley wasn't the only Wesley to have that type of an experience. In fact, with just a few weeks between them, John and Charles both had incredible experiences where they found the assurance of God's love. Wesley became the preacher who uh, went out and preached someplace almost every day. And Charles wrote their theology and hymns to share what it is that he had experienced uh, in God's love. And so today we're going to close with one of Charles' hymns, And Can It Be That I Should Gain, that shares the words that I can't believe that even I have discovered the love of God. So as we close today, I'd invite you to stand as we sing verses 1, 2, and 5 of And Can It Be That I Should Gain.
Again, if you are worshiping with us for the first time, thank you for being here. We are so glad that you are part of this family today. We do have some hubs out right out here or at the other end with information about the church and a gift for you. We'd love for you to stop by there so we can give that to you. If you're watching online, again, thank you for joining us, and we hope that you'll be able to join us in person someday, but online is a great way to be part of this family of faith. And as we go out from this place, may we know that the true mark of our faith is that God changes us from the inside out by warming our hearts, reminding us that we are loved and forgiven and that we are called to go out and to share God's love with the world. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen.